In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Both of our readings today, in different ways, tune in to making judgments about our behaviour. The Gospel started with Jesus describing the judgments that people made of him and his behaviours, contrasting him with John the Baptist and describing him as a drunkard, a glutton, and associating with sinners and tax collectors. And St Paul's letter to the Romans describes Paul's judgments of himself and his own behaviour choices. This letter, Paul's letter to the Romans, and the reading we heard today, reminded me of a sign I saw in Broadtown Church Primary School a few years ago, which said, your behaviour is your responsibility. We all know around children the ease with which they can say to one another, so-and-so made me do it, especially when we've been found out. But frankly, I've also seen us adults behaving this way too. This is all about a question of self-control. So what is self-control? Self-control at its simplest is exercising control over your feelings or actions or restraint exercised over one's own impulses, emotions or desires. In more spiritual language that we probably most think of, this is the active effort we put forth to resist temptations that are not God's way for us. A more positive take, behaviour honouring of our love of God and God's control on our lives. The good news is that self-control is a fruit of the Spirit as identified by Paul in his letter to the Galatians. This makes it something that the Holy Spirit can help us with. Having said that, I also don't want us to be left with the impression that I have got this completely sassed and I'm a shiny, squeaky clean example of self-control in my life. Thankfully, the words of Paul today resonate in my life and our lives as much as they did in his. For Paul says this, I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. The next piece of what he goes on to say is something like this, he longs to do the right thing, but ends up doing completely the other, the wrong thing. It's not a one-off, he does this over and over again. He is still vulnerable to temptation, just as we are. Weakness and wrongdoing, where we should have greater self-control, are his struggle, just as much as these things can be our struggle too. Struggling with self-control is not a new problem. Classical philosophers had thoughts here too. Conceptually, it was developed by Socrates about 2,400 years ago. Plato set it in opposition to overindulgence in both food and sex. And Aristotle discussed the differences between a person who has powerful passions and keeps them under control and the person who does not deliberately choose the wrong, but has no strength to resist temptation. I can't speak for you, but I often find Paul's take on things a bit difficult. But in this instance in Roman, Romans, Paul understands himself and his lapses in self-control very well. What a wretched man I am, he says in verse 24 of Romans 7. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Paul's answer to this question is Jesus' saving love for us on the cross. And this is the bridge to our gospel reading too. God's mercy and forgiveness and our deliverance and our need for thankfulness are Paul's answer. To live lives in response to that is Paul's answers. Here is a deep truth we celebrate as Christians, that if we acknowledge our weaknesses and mistakes and are sorry, we can put them behind us again. God forgives us and we can start again. New every morning is the love. For in God's eyes, what is needed is already done and done in and through Jesus Christ. Working on self-control is not the path to punishing times of hard labour to make up for the past mistakes or present weaknesses, or really agonising over our faults, living with crippling guilt and struggling, trying to do enough to earn a pardon. 
What needs to be done is done already in Jesus. To use the many languages, language of our hymns and songs, the debt is cleared, the price is paid, the slate wiped clean. God loves us and bids us welcome. Forgiveness is ours for the asking. We need only to reach out and receive. But there is more here, even this an amazing merciful forgiveness. The second half of the words of Jesus we heard today in the Gospel are a call to simplicity and of faith and in not making it difficult or just for the elite and the learned. This was a tide very much against the religious leaders of Jesus' day. The religious practice of his day was complicated, very complicated. One commentary I read said that daily life as a Pharisee was governed by 613 rules. Imagine living constrained like that. The sheer effort to remember them all would limit virtually any action. Our Bibles translated the end of verse 25 as infants, but many other translations make it like the childlike or as children. The inference here is that the wise and the intelligent do not receive the good news of Jesus Christ so readily because they can become proud and puffed up in their wisdom and can be unreceptive regarding the new and unexpected. Being childlike enables us to be unself-conscious, dependent and receptive, and to be more open to the unexpected and swings and roundabouts of life, and to help us to stay deeply rooted to God's merciful and everlasting love for us. Moving on to verse 27 and the heart of our gospel reading. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. We're heading into much more difficult territory to understand here. Jesus is explaining his unique place in the world, fully God and fully human. In this instance, he is explaining his relationship to God the Father. He alone is the one through whom God reveals himself to us. He is the only mediator of knowledge of the Father and of God's saving purposes for us. This is important for us to really digest and take to heart. Our part in this is our ability to recognise Jesus' unique role, the significance of Jesus and his opening out of his kingdom on earth to us. Our realisation of this changes our lives as we invite Jesus into our hearts and he moulds us through his spirit's work in us and through us. Are we joining with Paul's sentiments, giving room in our heart for Jesus' love for us to be first and foremost? Are we being thankful enough for that saving, amazing, eternal love, the love that, as they say, is the ground of our beings? The final part of our Gospel reading today includes some deeply reassuring words of Jesus, so typical of his love for us. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is contrasting his way of living on earth, lightly, lovingly, with integrity and open-heartedness to the guidance of God's Spirit, with the minutiae of the rules and regulations of the Pharisees, back at the 613 rules I was alluding to earlier, that governed religious observance of his day. Though it may sound like it a little, I don't think Jesus is saying, follow me and have an easy life. He is saying, follow me and have a fulfilled, meaningful life in him. Being a Christian is challenging and far from an easy option. Both depending on Jesus will give us both life and the rest we need to follow his unique plan for us. The version of these words from the message kind of brings this home, I think, where it says, Are you tired, worn out, burned out by religion? Come to me, get away with me and you'll recover your life. I think he means meaning and purpose and the hope we have in Jesus. Jesus goes on in, in that passage from the message. I'll show you how to take a real rest 
Walk with me, walk and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lie any, lay anything heavy or fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. I particularly liked in that, learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Grace is a rhythm that's governed by God and doesn't change. We can do nothing to earn it and it's not about our worthiness of it. From Jesus' fullness of life, he's coming to earth, dying and rising again, fully God and fully human. We have received all grace upon grace. We have all received grace upon grace. And there's a constant movement of waves of this grace in our hearts and our lives. I love the analogy of the waves on the shore for grace. One wave comes in as another is going out. The ebbing and flowing of the waves of grace lead to deep transformational changes and shifts in our observations of reality. These shifts change our perceptions, our interpretations, our thoughts, feelings, judgments and actions, helping us to live and grow and depend on God's love for us more and more. I'm going to end with a prayer following a pause. Let us pray. God of many names, gracious in your loving, merciful in your judgments, steadfast in your faithfulness to us, compassionate to all. May we always be thankful for all you have done, from creation to the end of time, into the eternity of your rest, May we also sing your praises, speak your greatness, and bring glory to you by our actions. Gracious, merciful, steadfast, compassionate, and loving God. Come to God, all who are weary and tired. Come to God, all who are burdened by life. Come to God, all who feel trapped and unappreciated. For you will find the rest you need, the peace you seek, and the love you long for. Come to God in Christ Jesus. Amen.